we are, you know, um, it's a nice sunshiny day, which is really great. Um, you know, it's been, you know, the last couple of months here in town have been uh, mm -hmm. difficult because we had these gargantuan tornadoes, which struck our community, mm -hmm. um, which destroyed large parts, uh, many homes, uh, many businesses, whole strips of the city were destroyed. And, you know, unfortunately, there were some lives lost as well. But yeah, Mother Nature is, um, you know, not predictable. It's actually, I, um, I really feel um, uh, bad that I didn't maintain enough communication with you during, with you during this uh, crisis that you, um, that you had. But thankfully, things have uh, now become better. And uh, hopefully for those people who got their houses destroyed have somewhat um, kind of like built them or got some compensation from the government to build them. How, how, what is the approach of the government in case uh, a tough tornado like this or blizzard hits um, the area? What kind of things do they do for the uh, civilians who get their uh, well, what, houses what destroyed? Happened, what happens is, is that, well, mo you know, if you, if you live in an apartment that is destroyed, that's mm -hmm. really not, there's really nothing you can do about that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, because you don't own the apartment. But what happens is, is that the governor of the state, but also the federal government, both of them can declare those disaster areas. Mm -hmm. And then special funds are available for the state and, you know, for people in order to receive those funds. And so a lot of those have to do with perhaps, you know, helping you relocate, um, building emergency shelters. Mm -hmm. food assistance and whatnot, you know, this is with all governments, um, things can take some time. Um, so I don't know if you were here during the hurricane Katrina, which wiped out a mm. lot of New Orleans and, uh, you know, but a lot of people, it was very difficult to navigate that system. Um, mm. And so, you know, they're, they're those, those, those offices, you know, don't have as many staff as they would, you know, need. Um, and so they get overwhelmed very easily. And so they can only help so many people at a time. Um, but I think, you know, I look around the city and a lot of people are rebuilding and so forth. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about the tornadoes we have in the U.S. And I think I think we're the only country now other countries have natural disasters. But I think we're the only country, maybe Mexico and maybe one other that has tornadoes on a fairly regular basis or Canada. And. Um, you know, the, I grew up with tornadoes and it's a strange thing where it's like you, they go so quickly and you hear mm -hmm. there's almost like a train roar. It almost sounds like mm -hmm. a train mm -hmm. and you, you can have a neighborhood in which all houses are destroyed and then one is fine and there's nothing wrong. Like they could, the kid could have left his bike out there at night and mm -hmm. it's still sitting there. And well, that's, that's really strange. Why, why is this happening? I think it's because there's a. You know, tornadoes are sort of like um, an adolescent boy who's kind of up on, you know, taking too much caffeine <laughs> and they're just jumping and, they, you know, they just, they do things. Uh, so sometimes they'll actually just raise up uh, and come over it. And so it, it's, it's very unpredictable in that way, but there's, tornadoes can be so strong that so they can actually, and there's videos of these, they'll mm -hmm. lift up a semi truck mm -hmm. and just throw it in the air. And, but there'll be a motorcycle right next to it and it's unharmed, mm -hmm. you know, in the power. But this, this tornado stretched for hours. I mean, it was like 70 miles long, mm -hmm. which is just, I mean, incredible length. Um, I don't know what those, that I can't, I can't remember what that is in kilometers, but it's a really long time. And, uh, you know, sometimes there can be major damage. Sometimes there can be um, none. But what I think is, you know, interesting from a linguistic perspective, something you brought up um, a little bit ago about keeping in touch. And that's a, you know, that's a, a thing where in the United States, uh, people now get annoyed, even though we still do it when we say things like thoughts and prayers, you know, so mm -hmm. many times people will write thoughts and prayers. And a lot of people don't know what to write especially during these circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, so and there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's not really a standard of a, um, let me just close my email here. Um, it's not really of a, of a, a standard 
of a reply culturally because there are some people who say, well, I don't want to bother them right now because mm-hmm. they don't want them to, you know, they're already yeah. overwhelmed and I'm not going to be helping. There's some people who want to keep in touch. There are others who say, you know, do you need anything? Mm-hmm. Um, and some people say, do you need anything with real heart? And they mean it and they will help. Mm-hmm. And some people say it as a way of just saying, I'm so sorry about this, you know, um, and, you know, it's, it's, so that's, that I think is that we're in a kind of a weird position as a society linguistically is how do you talk to people in, you know, very difficult delicate, situations? Very yeah, delicate, delicate or sensitive. Very delicate or sensitive. Like, you know? yeah. Yes, for example, when, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a family member dies, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, blank, blank, blank. Some people say, oh, you know, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. He or she is in a better place now mm-hmm. with God. And sometimes that makes people very upset because mm-hmm. they say like, you know, I don't want my child or my sibling or to be with, I want them to be with me. You know, that does not mm-hmm. make me feel better. And so they'll become upset. It's even, you know, I didn't know what to say. Um, I was speaking with um, an acquaintance um, in Ukraine um, and you know, all the things which are going on there. And this person said they were driving their spouse to the border, one of the borders, um, you know, and there was really bad situation. And, you know, they sent some pictures and whatnot. Mm. And so, you know, is there anything you can say, you know, that won't sound insulting or like, you know, useless, you know, like you don't know because you're not in that situation. And so I'm thinking like, if I were there, you know, and if someone said, oh, you know, best of luck, you know, or be safe or something like this. And you think like, what, what kind of, you know, but that's, people don't mean to sound insensitive, but they don't know what else to say. It's actually, you know? a ling- can, can we, can we say it's a linguistic um, minefield where you, you don't know where to step and you don't know uh, whether this mine is going to go off or it's just going to give you another chance to live uh the day let me just close the door because kids are yeah. the other side. <clears throat> so um men- the sp- sp- speaking of linguistics this is uh probably the second um time we touch base um on issues that have to do with culture and linguistics and Uh, It's quite fascinating, actually, to get in touch with you and seize this opportunity to talk with you regarding a few major um, topics about linguistics, since you are a um, pioneering person in uh, in your university and have a big big position that, that demands a lot of things from you. So how do you approach linguistics in the department? Just... uh, if you can give us like some um, idea about that. Well, I mean, this is also say, this is interesting culturally because Uh you said all those very nice things about me and culturally in the United States at least, or maybe this is just my personality Uh or my family, the place I grew up with, you know, using such praise, you're like, oh, thank you. And then you feel it's obligatory to feel embarrassed about it. You know, like to feel like, oh, you know, you should, or to downplay yourself or something like, you know, no, 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 no. Um, you know, and uh, so that's very kind of you, but um, yes. And so, I, you know, linguistics, I think is one of those areas. And I was talking to some students about this yesterday. Mm-hmm. I think linguistics is in a very good position as a discipline because, you know, as you probably know, the old saying, Linguistics is the most scientific of the humanities, the Mm -hmm. least scientific of the sciences. Um, And so it has its world. It can kind of appeal to people in a variety of different ways. And a couple of things I think about that. Number one is that you can show linguistics to people in sciences and humanities and arts, and you Mm -hmm. can bring it from a perspective which they will find interesting. So for example, I'm right now teaching a course on history of the English language. And Mm -hmm. one of the things we're talking about is, you know, the differences in old English poetry with kind of poetry now. And so old English poetry had not yet been influenced to a great deal by Latin or French. And so it tended to use a very simple style 
simple sentences, straightforward. They use a lot of, uh, as kind of the uh, poetic devices, alliteration was a big one. Um, and, you know, that's very interesting for students who are like, oh gosh, you know, we don't write in poetry or we don't write poetry that much anymore. What really changed about it? Why is it different? And you can show them, well, you have the influences from Latin, you have the big influences from French in terms of the style, the vocabulary and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you can also, in the same class, you know, talk to students who are interested in, let's say, computer science and say, look, we can really analyze a lot of these differences now with great corpus linguistics. These corpora can show us the linguistic changes which have been going on for hundreds of years. Paul, and Paul will be back just um, to let you know. Okay. Yeah, keep, can you can keep talking and I will cut it out of the... Um, of the editing, this just add my picture too. Oh, yes. sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can show them, these computer science students are like, look, we can take all of this data and learn about language patterns. And we can not only learn about that um, with things like, you know, how poetry changes, but about how advertising language changes, how mm -hmm. differences between uh, regions, about differences in like, um, you know, uh, how people market things, um, you know, different word changes, what words have fallen out of fashion, which ones are still around. And they find that very interesting. So I think that you have that ability in linguistics to go a long way. But something else about linguistics, which I've always liked, is that, you know, there's been a problem, particularly in the Western world, I would say in the last 30, 40 years, where mm -hmm. a lot of writing, especially in the humanities, is so dense and is so hard to read. So there used to be a thing called the bad writing contest. And I believe it was a journal called Literature and Philosophy. And they would pick out excerpts from academic articles or books, which were just incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of it is focused on postmodernism, a lot of polysyllabic words, a lot of words, a lot of sentences where you could not break them down even if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And what, what that has done, I think, is kind of alienate a lot of people, uh, make them feel like this is inaccessible to them, but also make them feel like this is not of use. Mm -hmm. And so I think that linguistics, even though in the academic, really hyper academic realm, is going to be difficult because it has a certain jargon that you have to mm -hmm. be familiar with. I think popular linguistics is intuitively interesting to people. And, um, you know, it's quite easily, you know, understandable, a lot of it. Now, I think um, one, of the, um, one of the best essays that were written in, in this topic in particular is the one about politics and the English language by George Orwell, where he said that the more academic, well, not necessarily academic, but the more jargon and long words the writer uses, uh, the higher chance that he is hiding his inner intentions from the um, declared ones, uh, or there is a higher level of hypocrisy regarding an issue. And he draws an example. I don't know, it's quite interesting because he brought an example from um, a writer who talks about the Russian totalitarianism. And he said, uh, that this writer um, wants to say something, but he doesn't want to insult the authority. So he describes the killing of people in the back of their necks, shooting them or hanging them or, you know, um, annihilating them or alienating them, or sending them to um, camps in Antarctica or somewhere. Um, so instead of that, he said, that within the within the achievements that have been done, I'm just paraphrasing what he said because I don't literally remember. Um, part, he he describes it as as uh, in a way that sounds really um, uh, how do we say it? There's there's a word um, that we use in linguistics for for that to ameliorate the effect of the word. Um, and say, uh, within considering the achievements that the regime has done, it's 
necessary to some extent that those people are treated in abnormal conditions or something like that. So he, he doesn't exactly use the word. So it comes to the researcher and the person interested in linguistics to read between the lines and understand the um, manipulation uh, structure. There's also an article that was written about Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia in the Atlantic. And then just because uh, there was some accusations that he was the major guy, the guy behind his assassination, Washington Post has posted a reply to the interview, just declaring that this is just a shame for journalism to do this interview. And if you look at the kind of writing, it's really fascinating how these two polls in journalism are, you know, uh, saying things for the government or for 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 this king and saying things against him. They're just manipulating words and twisting them in a way that is really artistic and uh, manipulative way. Well, and I think what's happened in English, and I think, well, one thing I think is a universal mm -hmm. is that phenomenon. I think you can find it in all languages and you know, using euphemisms, mm -hmm. you know. That's uh, the word that I was looking yes. for. <laughs> yes. So using words like casualties, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, that sounds so like uh, mild, you know, mild, you know, like he had um, a few cuts in his hand. <laughs> right. He had a few cuts in his hand, you know, um, using things like, you know, um, uh, uh, displaced, you know, mm -hmm. instead of expelled and kicked off mm -hmm. their land or their property. Um, you know, so we kind of soften the blow on these things and offer kind of qualifiers and so it doesn't it doesn't sound quite as bad and i remember you know um some years ago somebody was talking about you know how the language at least in the united states of vietnam really mm -hmm. changed because people were just fed up with saying well how many casualties were there today in vietnam and it was just sort of matter of fact and so forth not really emphasizing the fact that you know these 18 year old boys who had no knowledge of the world, probably little education, were mm -hmm. just many times sent in and just got, you know, killed um, very quickly. And, you know, in other countries as well. Yeah, and I think, especially in English, you know, a couple characteristics you will see there is, you know, number one is the use mm -hmm. of the passive, passive voice. And you even use the passive voice. You know, these have been, you know, it has been reported. It has been found. Um, these men were seen to blank, blank, blank. And so there's no real agent there. There's no source. Who said this? What are they responsible for? Who mm -hmm. did what to whom? And the other thing is, I think, which is distressing about that, is that sometimes they're trying to cover up, but sometimes they don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they're just trying to report things in a way that gives an official report and they themselves don't understand it. So I think that, I think that many times, you know, particularly people who enjoy conspiracies, they give far too much credit, far too much credit to organizations, you know, and I remember I think these people are human, they make mistakes, they have lots of things to do um, many times, you know, and if you do that, you know, you think like, oh, they know everything. I'm like, well, that's another word, they, you don't know who they refer to, the antecedent mm -hmm. is unclear. But other times people, you know, incompetence is a real human quality mm -hmm. that a lot of people have no idea. They don't take things seriously. They don't notice or they're too overwhelmed with other tasks. So I think that that is, I think that is absolutely true. I think another thing, you know, Chomsky, whom you interviewed, um, talked about this as well as like, if you, you know, use difficult jargon mm -hmm. um, in grammatical constructions, you know, uh, then you're kind of shielding yourself because mm -hmm. like, well, you don't understand it. So what can you say about it? Mm -hmm. you know? um, uh, it's interesting that we brought up this topic because it's actually uh, pressing, especially with part of my PhD was, um, uh, was done um, by analyzing the political bias in media using certain excerpts from Middle East newspapers in particular. And you could see that how this newspaper or that is subordinate to the government and to their regime. 
that governs the state and they choose every single word carefully. And for that, I'm quoting this from George Orwell that I just mentioned. Um, and if you allow me to share it here sure. from um, politics and the English language, because it's really getting uh, the, uh, the essence of what we are looking for. Um, he's saying people are imprisoned for years without trial or shot in the back of the neck or sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called the elimination of unreliable elements. <laughs> um, some comfortable English professor defending Russian totalitarianism. He cannot say outright, I believe in killing off your opponents when you can get good results by doing so. So he probably says something like this, while freely conceding with the Soviet regime exhibits certain features which the humanitarian may be inclined to deplore, we must, I think, agree <laughs> that um, a certain um, curtailment of the right to political opposition is an unavoidable um, concomitant of a transitional period. This is like, this is the jargon we are talking about. They're just hiding something. And in this article, in this essay, he mentions on more than one occasion, the fact that this is the true hypocrisy when you avoid saying and naming things by their name. You're just using this kind of uplifted kind of language jargon just to hide your inner intentions. So I wanted to quote this because this is probably, I felt the right time to talk about it uh, since you brought it up. Well, I think that this is also brings us to the issue of, you know, looking at English specifically. And so I look at the, those excerpts and I think, gosh, you know, that's very Latin. That's very French, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, knowledge of those words, I mean, and so it's basically like the foreign language mm -hmm. elements of English will mean that you're more educated, will mean that you are, um, let's say, more savvy with words, mm -hmm. and will mean that you can hide things. And so, you know, a lot of this, I think, you know, and Chomsky talked about this before, a lot of this is very damaging. And we've seen this, you know, um, for, it, it, you know, uh, on a number of levels, but one level is we just don't reach people. They don't know what we do. Um, mm. it, we're kind of off limits to them, but it's actually very undemocratic if you think about it, because you know this type of writing, which, in, and I'm sure that you see it in older Arabic or very literate Arabic, mm -hmm. which is like the average person might have some difficulty understanding that. They don't really use that type of language, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of elevated flowery language on a, a normal basis. Well, a lot of this was in, it was developed when you had a very undemocratic societies, when you had monarchies, when you had rulers and you, and you wanted to keep the space very small. You didn't mm -hmm. want to open up opportunities to the normal people, to the hoi polloi. You mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, keep the circle. And you think, you know, if, if we truly believe that everyone in theory, at least, should have access to information, should be able to read literature, should be able to participate in public life. Yeah. We have to do this. But on the other hand, there's something else that's happened, particularly in the US and probably Britain as well, um, in that now we have that sort of obscure language, but we also have highly unrefined, basically shouting language. And so that is another way to kind of manipulate people into silence. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call you a bad word. I'm every, um, every news headline is breaking news. Mm -hmm. Everything is a disaster. Everything is awful. Everything is broken. And so now you look at it, it's like, you know, two months after somebody leaves office, they'll get back on the TV and say, oh my gosh, this new person has destroyed the country. And so it's this level of exaggeration. So now we don't as much say, you know, the system works very well, but we need to do this, this, and that, right? Here's the things we need to work on. We don't really hear that type of talk anymore. Mm -hmm. The case is reversed here in Iraq. And I'll give you an example of clergymen and how they approach people linguistically speaking. Um, the majority of people actually here in Iraq post-2003 have started to kind of like get that religious pigment 
because of the trend and the influence of neighborhood neighboring countries and um one way i i keep asking my friends why do people follow those uh who speak with this kind of not jargon language but very vulgar language they are in religious positions they hold decision making roles in the government but they cannot make one single sentence in a way that has some good arabic sophistication to it or a clear um, syntactic structure of arabic because when they read their speeches they often make so many mistakes when they read them they don't make one single sentence correctly they don't say it correctly um and by they i mean more than one there's so many people and i ask my friends why do you think those people just reverse the whole picture they don't use that kind of elevated language they do, they use the vulgar well it turned out that there is this issue that they have where um since we are study the philosophy of religion and we understand God in a way of his own Holy Quran language, you are not supposed to understand what we are talking about. So we are using your language to talk to you through your language. But there is no one single occasion where they can show off their own um, um, grammatical skills or their eloquence in language or their mastery of rhetorics of linguistics or language in general. So it's completely reversed in our culture, but again, employed in a way that benefits political parties. Yes, and you know, um, in the uh, a lot of that speech is, and, and I, I don't obviously speak Arabic, but I'm just talking from an American perspective, mm -hmm. actually reinforces um, I would say many times very negative impulses in pe people mm -hmm. in order to become popular. So one of them is it's us against them, mm -hmm. right? Instead of you looking at your neighbor as like, you know, we don't get along on certain issues. We don't agree, but my neighbor is a person and I value that they're alive and whatnot. It, it, it is, it, at least in the United States, it, it, uh, the speech is as if they are demons, right? Mm -hmm. As if they're the worst people in the world, um, as if, you know, and there's a certain sort of posturing there. And I, you know, I like to just call it like a fake masculinity, right? Or man posing, mm -hmm. like where you try to look like, um, you know, you try to look at these kind of stereotypical views of being a man. I'm tough. I don't put up with anything. I say the truth. I do all this and that. And I think that this is like, wow, no, you're not saying the truth. You're just being vulgar. You're being hateful. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing people together. You're not building institutions to help children. You're just, you know, doing this and you become popular. And, you know, I think psychologically, this is damaging. I really do feel it depresses people, mm -hmm. you know, but they get addicted to that type of thing. In the U.S., we've had this going on for quite a while. And, you know, it's first it was kind of in certain aspects of the media and now it's political show. And so I don't know if you were in the United States, if, when you were in the United States, if you ever saw wrestling on TV mm -hmm. or anything. Of course. Yeah. It's sort of like wrestling, you know, this, this guy's this, and they're not actually addressing real fundamental problems. And mm -hmm. I, I like to watch old speeches by past presidents and one of, you know, um, even though he left office in disgrace, um, I was Nixon watching. Or... Exactly. Uh, yes. I was, so I was talking, thinking about Nixon, mm -hmm. the way that he spoke. Are you talking about the Watergate crisis or another yes. thing? A scandal? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. the water, so he left in disgrace because of Watergate, mm -hmm. um, you know, that he basically had several men break into a hotel and, you know, steal all these documents and so forth. Um, but, you know, I was listening to him speak and he was doing an interview and it was very long. And I thought no one speaks like this anymore. He would be considered uh, now like too nerdy, uh, mm -hmm. too academic um, because he would, you know, address problems and talk about long term implications of them. And I think like, we, why don't we want that anymore? 
You know, we just want someone who's a cheerleader for something and who says, I'm going to bring miracles and they never do, you know, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I think it, it's, it's a global decline because we in Iraq face exactly the same issue here. People like to listen to uh, speakers who use very taboo, very many taboo words and vulgar language, and they unequivocally uh, declare that they are using plus 18 expressions just to show off and um, impress people. While those people who just, um, you know, use this kind of, you said, nerdy, um, I would just say an intelligent language, uh, a language uh, that represents the, um, the circle of academia, uh, the language that represents sophistication and elegance. Uh, it's not necessarily so much jargon or specialized language. It is just sophisticated language, like the language of uh, President Nixon or um, those um, in that era. Um, it's not used anymore, and it's it's a global decline. If if you watch TikTok as an example, this application is flooded with so many bad uh, videos that they use very bad language. I mean, in Arabic in Iraqi Arabic or in um, Arabic in general. And um, I'm watching so many videos from the United States and they're just sort of like the same issue. Yes, and, and, and you know what's, I think it, you know, at least in the United States, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I know women do this as well, but I think for a lot of young men, this is also an identity crisis about what does it mean to be a male now what does it mean to have your place in society? And so one, one easy answer is in society changes, but if you don't want to deal with that or it's difficult, one easy answer is to use vulgar language, to show yourself, you know, to go and buy a ton of guns and show yourself like this. And, you know, maybe the guy, <laughs> and sometimes I see these guys, you know, and it's just, I think to myself, these are like what we did when we were 11, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, it's sort of um, almost like Hollywood kind of idea about toughness. And the irony is you had all these, especially that World War II generation, they went through the depression, they all fought in the war, you know, they, they've seen really terrible things. And, um, you know, and, and then people would say, oh, they didn't do any of that. So for example, during the election of 1992, mm -hmm. um, one of the criticisms of George H.W. Bush is like, oh, he's weak, he's this, that. And I'm like, George H.W. Bush was a fighter pilot who was shot down during World War II. Like this guy had, had an enormous amount of courage, but he was mm -hmm. not going around and trying to pose and say, I'm a real guy. But now I see some of these guys, they're not doing much. They mm -hmm. think that gives them a platform, you know, and, you know, they think, well, I'm going to amass all these weapons. And you think you're, you, you're 200 pounds overweight. Like in a war, you wouldn't survive 15 minutes, you know, yes. like you would be gone. You have no idea what, what those things are. There's no fast food restaurants during a war. You know, there's no, none of that. And I've talked to, you know, a lot of um, people like of older generations, like one of my uncles was in Vietnam and mm -hmm. they don't, they don't talk like that. I mean, they really don't want to think about it so much. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, it's the stigma that the United States in general had from that war and what consecutively happened after war and all the global blame that it had because of that decision to go into war. Um, I think it's a global phenomenon of loss of identity, um, but it's definitely reflected in the ter in terms of language use and yeah. i can see that in um the normal normal citizens here in iraq i'm not i haven't traveled back to the united states for the past five years i've traveled to europe i didn't spend that much time in europe i didn't have that personal contact to get a sense of the kind of, of true language in there but i can tell it from a um 
an observer point of view in Iraq who's been living for almost his all of his life. People here lost their identity, period. Now they lost their identity because of the consecutive of wars and lack of suitable education system and uh, lack of enough care by their parents. Uh, the generation of 1980s had their parents, most of them served in the military or died in, in the conflict between Iraq and um, Iran. So most of the care uh, for their education was attributed to either their mothers or to the local schools that were struggling at that time to, to find <clears throat> people to teach because teachers were, were paid $2 per month during the 19, um, during the period between 19, um, 19, but the beginning of the Iranian Iraq war to 1998, where the war ended. And then with the uh, siege against Iraq in 1991, there was another war on Iraq, but that war was economic. So most of people, well, a lot of students didn't go to schools, didn't graduate. And even when they graduated, they still worked as uh, workers and their labor just took much of their life and their education was really minimal. So when this generation uh, jumped into the second millennium and uh, got married and had babies, those babies now of 2000 who were born after 2003, they don't know who, who Saddam Hussein is. And they don't see a clear image of the true um, um, identity person that they follow. We don't have that many role models, role models in, in, in the field of research or in science. I mean, we don't have an alternative to Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or um, the infrastructure here is not conducive to this kind of thinking. There are attempts, but these attempts are just um, countable. And probably that is why a lot of them just either recruit, get recruited in military or in um, some sort of gangs um, and they just lose their future because they about, lost their identity. Well, and you think about, you know, what the little that I do know about Iraq is like, how do they know about, you know, it's, it's really a shame. Do they know about for hundreds of, or thousands of years, the scholarship, the art, you know, the trading, the literature, all of these, you know, great thinkers, especially in the medieval world, who yeah. came out of there and what they offered to civilization. And, you know, that's something where, you know, you go back and you think, you know, the, 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 these cities and these civilizations, you read about them and you think how layered, how complex. And they had these scholars who in the medieval world were writing hundreds of books mm -hmm. by hand, you know, on religion, on um, astronomy, on geography, on traveling and, you know, poetry. And you think, gosh, you know, like you wonder how many of these young men are aware of those figures. You, you know, know um, it's really saddening to tell this, but there's not that much awareness of that. There's high level of ignorance among a young generation. I mean, even with the presence of technology and internet, um, their passion for reading and exploring and discovering should be balanced with finding good opportunities to work. And most of them are struggling to find work because they are struggling to find work. They don't see that quite benefit of reading. Um, mm. We literally have one street for selling books in Baghdad and minor um, libraries and bookstores here and there. Uh, public libraries are not that functional. And um, this generation, as I said, lost his identity or their identity because they 
it seems to me that the, 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 this, there was some sort of disconnection between their heritage and civilization and consecutive centuries of exploration and discovery in all walks of life and what is happening in the world right now because of globalization and um, the influence of um, uh, technology on, on their minds. They spent most of the time either doing watching, browsing Facebook or YouTube or um, just posting things that are really silly that do not represent their true identity and what they have. I remember a story about Imam Ghazali, who's one of the of the, the best thinkers during, I think, the Abbasid age, uh, where he, he wrote one of his books on reed, and he carried the reed um, on, um, on the back of a donkey. And in the middle of the road, um, he faced a gang that took all of, the, all of the chapters of this book and they burned it, they burned that down. So he went back home and based on what he remembered, he wrote, he wrote the book again. So this self-determination and the ability to do things in very austere and critical times um, sh should be something to be studied and scrutinized and learn something of. They, they represent the true image of uh, perseverance and dedication to their field and their work. Here on the opposite side, things have dramatically and drastically changed in this generation. I don't know about the generation now in the United States because last time I was there like five or six years ago. How do you observe this generation and, and their passion for reading or uh, discovering science? Is it the same uh, as 10 years ago, 15 years ago? In certain ways, I mean, certain things discourage me, but certain things give me hope. So for example, um, you know, the things which discourage me now is that life, it, it, and a lot of older generations do not recognize this, mm -hmm. is that life for young people now, in general, is more difficult. So I'll give you a couple of reasons why. So in like the 1970s and the 80s, you could go to a state university, a public one, for mm -hmm. very cheap. It was mm -hmm. very cheap. And you could maybe work a part-time job, work a summer job and then you could be okay. But now we have so many students who have to take out, because the states don't invest in those institutions anymore, they mm -hmm. have to take out huge loans, which they have to pay back. They also have to work, you know, something like 30 hours a week. So that is very difficult. Wages um, have gone down for the middle class by about 20% since the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, healthcare is much more expensive. Housing is much more expensive. Um, and there's now, you know, there's just a lot more required for a lot of jobs. And so of whereas before you could have a degree and they would hire you. Now they want internships. They want all these different things. You got to have computer skills so on and so forth. So it can be a very difficult situation. And one of the things that we've found because of this is like, you know, there's no free lunch. A lot of people in the you know, last 40 years have said, we, we want to save money on taxes, but they've also created these other problems. In addition to the fact that people now, because of finances, um, among other things, but it's a big thing, are not having as many children mm -hmm. or they're having them very late. And so now the birth rate in the United States is down. It's, declining. Mm -hmm. it's very much declining. And the only thing which keeps us afloat in terms of population is immigration. So mm -hmm. in many ways, we're mirroring all these things which happened in Europe 20, 30 years ago. So that causes a labor shortage, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't have enough people. But on the other hand, though, I feel encouraged by um, younger people because I see so much perseverance. I see, you know, um, when I see uh, really this awful stuff on social media, and I know that there are young people involved with this, but mostly not, right? So a lot of it, are what they call digital immigrants. So mm -hmm. older people who didn't grow up with this, they don't know how to handle it. Um, and so my interactions with students now, generally I found them to be very respectful, very interested in different types of things. Certainly students now are much more interested in multiculturalism than they were before. 
and learning about the world and traveling. So for example, in our department for Chinese New Year, they had, um, we had this open thing where it's this Chinese New Year celebration mm -hmm. and they served boba tea, which comes from um, Taiwan and it was packed. I mean, it was packed. <laughs> and so you have all the, you know, you, and, and, and all these students come from different uh, backgrounds and so forth. Mm. So in that way, you know, I feel um, encouraged by that. And nothing is perfect. Of course. There's some huge challenges. Mm -hmm. But a lot, a lot of the things I look at is economic challenges, many times by rotten policies. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, I see a little bit more sobriety, I guess. Mm. Talking about debt and uh, getting loans from the banks. I have a friend of mine, her name is Sarah, and now she is in uh, Boulder in Colorado. She still pays the loans for her master's degree program that we graduated from in 2013. And it's really sad because people should move on with their life. I mean, to some extent, there should be some sort of uh, help or assistance from the government because they, they're taking these loans, not because they love their banks. They just want to find a decent job to work in. So, uh, you know, paying loans for your master's degree for like 20 plus years is just something crazy. And, um, and a lot of times it's not for banks, it's from the government. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the government, you know, and the law with student loans is there's no reason or you can never go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you, so you could go bankrupt and from the, for, for business problems, for health problems, but for student loans, the only escape is death. That is the only escape. And so in a certain way, the government has cut taxes on a lot of very wealthy individuals and large corporations, but then they charge, they say, okay, we'll give you this, and they charge interest with it, and you have to start paying like six months after you graduate, and so it's like, it's making money off of the backs of people who are just starting their lives, mm -hmm. you know, and then, so these people have, they didn't do anything wrong, you know, they weren't irresponsible, adults told them, do this, this is the right thing, well, and now, you know, your salary and everyone knows this, like if you get a first job, you're never going to make in a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. you know, but after a while, if your wages don't go up, if your health care becomes more expensive, if you have a medical problem, this can destroy your life. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not something, well, it's not nature like tornadoes we were talking about. It is something, it was a policy, um, you know, that a lot of people simply don't care about. And, you know, the current administration has made some strides, like there's been some loan forgiveness, some of the loans have been expunged. There has to be a lot more because, you know, a lot of people 30, 40 years ago used to buy a house when they were 24, 25 years old and they could afford it's it now. To buy. <laughs> it's impossible now. Yeah. It's impossible. Um, it's quite, um, I mean, most of the universities now in Iraq are, um, not most actually, because I don't have a statistical study for that, but the majority of universities are government and people go there, don't pay uh, for, for the government to, um, to study, but they're private, but the quality of study at government um, is variable when we compare it to private sector government um, universities. Um, did I say government for colleges? Because I meant colleges. Right, right. Um, however, I'm a little bit biased here because um, you have very uh, probably limited time and I, I wanted to seize the opportunity to ask you this important question that sure. I jotted down here. Um, since you are uh, the interim um, head of the Department of Modern Languages at the um, university, what are some of the, um, what are the, some of trend, modern trends that you have in, in, in the study and uh, teaching and the studying and teaching of um, languages at the department? How do you approach language? Um, and how do you make students approach language? Because that is going to shed some light on how we should um, do that here in Iraq in particular. 
I think that traditionally language departments in the United States have mm -hmm. followed a very similar trajectory. And that is this, you take basic language classes, mm -hmm. uh, you take some writing classes, and then you take literature and classes on civilization. Mm -hmm. And that was the traditional way of doing that. Now, for some students, they really like that. They benefited from that. But I think what we know now is you have to broaden your horizons mm -hmm. and you have to look at life after graduation. So one of the things that we're really trying to do, and I think a lot of language departments are, is like, how do you integrate this with what they want to do with their career goals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so offering opportunities to really think about the types of language that you need, you know, to say be a bilingual attorney or the types of language you need to say be, you know, work for the foreign service and so forth. So having them do that. Another one um, is really focusing, and this is what I've been trying to do, is focusing on learner autonomy. And something, you know, Iraqis and North Americans were not like a lot of Western European countries where we have very good instruction in a foreign language from the mm -hmm. first grade, right? We, most of our countries are, are largely monolingual. Um, we don't meet, we meet, might meet some people, at least in the United States, but we don't speak their language with them and really showing them, you know, you need to be autonomous and learn on your own as well. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, there is another debate. It's um, it's a debate that is taking place here in Iraq because of because of TESOL and TESOL is is perceived as the bastard major of linguistics because pe people here don't welcome it as much as linguistics. And when when you say it's a it's part of applied linguistics, they just don't look at it from an applied point of view. They just look at it as something. Um, that is new, that is like, I don't know, maybe it's a nemesis or something like that, that is perceived here. I don't know why, um, but how do you, how do you incorporate the methods of teaching and TESOL while you're teaching in, in languages in the department? Maybe if you can give us a little bit of the general vision that you have about uh, TESOL in particular. I think that, you know, when you're teaching linguistics, you always have to approach it from a variety of angles and look at your mm -hmm. class and say, say, what might they do with this? You know, gone are the days. And we kind of talked about this a little bit at the beginning where you could be a theoretician, mm -hmm. you could be someone who is- <laughs> That's absolutely true. You know, and this is what- <laughs> I, mean, yes. I mean, let's be honest, there are no, Nowhere in the world are there a lot of jobs in this. Yeah. And so when people say I'm interested in doing, let's say, you know, romance philology or something like mm -hmm. this, say you better have a basis in language teaching because that will give you the employment to actually do that stuff that you want. So, mm -hmm. you know, when students come to me and say, I want to get a PhD, I say, okay, you can do it in linguistics, that's fine but you're gonna to have to do a couple of things. Number one is you have to have a secondary area mm -hmm. and that secondary area has to be one that, that universities and schools want. And yes. what is always gonna be that secondary area, beginning level teaching, intermediate level teaching. Mm -hmm. If you don't like that, don't get a PhD in linguistics unless you are such a hot shot, you know, that you know you can get employment or you're so wealthy Mm -hmm. You know, that it really doesn't matter to you. And most people don't fall into those two categories. So I say like, in, in people who are interested in, they might say, well, I'm interested in Arabic literature. I'm interested in Spanish literature. And I'll say, okay, here's how your job would be. You will be teaching four courses a semester, beginning level language one, beginning level language two, composition, and maybe, maybe one literature class on that maybe one literature class per year. And simply the fact is most students are not interested in the highly theoretical things. There are mm -hmm. some, um, and, but just the reality is, you know, this is, you have to think about this from a practical perspective. How are you going to work? 
what are you going to do in order to do the stuff that you really like? So if you want to do research and maybe teach a course every once in a while on, you know, this, the syntactical, you know, transformations in medieval Iraqi Arabic or something like this, um, then, you know, you're going to have to make sure that that's not what all you do. And I think also knowing TESOL helps you learn to communicate well. And in the, in, you know, now, like before, you could be a real bore mm -hmm. and just sit there and talk. And students really didn't have any choice. Um, you know, we've all had professors like that. And it really didn't matter. Well, now students won't put up with it. They just mm -hmm. won't take your classes. And so TESOL teaches you about the importance of, of actually course. communicating clearly, not only to non-native speakers, but to native speakers. Of course. I mean, I, I wouldn't have met Chomsky or Steven Pinker had I not studied TESOL because it just equipped me with, and I wouldn't have been able to meet you and talk to you and make this beautiful friendship um, had I not studied uh, TESOL and methods of teaching and how to communicate, because it's essentially um, how to communicate what you know to people. What we know that we know um, is different from getting what we know to other people's mind. And it's, it's a completely different mechanism and it has different parameters and ways of, uh, you know, getting their, getting the message from our mind to their mind. It's, it's really complicated process. It's not as easy as people think it is because we're just installing a new operating system in their mind. And that coding of this system takes a humongous amount of work. Um, however, um, Professor, I really thank you for this. Um, well, thanks for staying up late. And again, I'm, should I say I'm so sorry for uh, the loss of the neighborhood with the tornado and oh, what yeah. happened. I'm, I'm really feeling bad about it. No, no, um, no, no. I mean, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, opportunity to give us. And uh, hopefully once uh, you have other time to uh, chat, to continue our chatting, please let me know. Show me an email. I'm only one email away. Oh, that's, I know, I know. But, it, it, you know, that's the thing is when you have a busy job, you're doing a doctorate, you have a family, and I have a similar situation. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I can make it. And then 10 minutes later, like, no, I can't make it. You know, did I, I mean, tell you that I I graduated on uh, and last December and I have my PhD now? <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, Thank so doctor. Thank you so much. Doctor. This, is, um, this is my um, dissertation. It's a little bit dusty because we have um um dust and weather it's um it's a little bit interesting it's a critical discourse analysis of political bias in selected newspapers wow um and i've talked about political bias in media in particular um in um in this uh, dissertation however um I'm really excited actually to open a new venue of discussion. Uh, we have a list of questions here I have uh, that I will uh, send them to you in case you're yeah, interested. Um, absolutely. Week next week we will definitely have. It's, uh, it's about general linguistics and your thoughts and your vision uh, about general linguistics and your observation about cultures because you have just shed some light on that local gathering um, of the Chinese um, holiday or celebration. And it's really fascinating if we can just get some glimpses of yes. um, linguistic observations from your side and what you notice they do. And uh, we talk about the fields of language and linguistics. I think it's really fascinating and refreshing to touch base on that. I and, do too. Um, and also I have other questions regarding popular linguistics. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably this is a new um, field where we can just do a little bit of discussion about it um, and to see where that will get us to. Great. Well, I look forward to it. And, you know, um, yes. And so just send me those questions and we'll go. Absolutely. Over that. You know, the meeting of the minds will, uh, will occur. Uh, great. That's great. Thank you so much, Professor. And I look forward to see you in our next meeting. 
I do too. God bless you and have a good day. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.